Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Glassman from the Leatherman Spine Center in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, welcome to tonight's uh, case conference uh, discussion on vertebral osteomyelitis. I'd like firstly to really thank the folks from the Seattle Science Foundation who've done such a fantastic job uh, putting this series together and uh, we appreciate uh, their help with uh, tonight's uh, uh, presentation as well. And I'd like to turn things over to my partner and our fellowship director at, at Leatherman, uh, Dr. Milad Drosovic. Thanks, Steve. And likewise, I'd really like to thank Seattle Science for uh, putting on this tremendous program that I think has been a real, uh, real service to fellows in this time of COVID. Um, so, uh, Alexis, if uh, somehow uh, it seems to be advancing without me here. So here's our agenda for tonight. Hopefully it's not too ambitious. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick um, overview talk uh, on the subject of osteomyelitis. Trey Crawford, uh, uh, one of my partners, is going to kind of go over some of the new infectious disease guidelines that have come out uh, with respect to spinal infections. And then uh, our fellows, Dr. Ben Geddes and Dr. Aiden Ka Kashigar, are going to present a couple of cases. And then we'll kind of pause the cases and have John Dimar uh, give a really good talk uh, that I've seen before on, uh, on uh, technical pearls and surgical approaches uh, on these cases. Um, and then, and then uh, Dr. John Buza, who's also one of our fellows, will uh, give us a third case. And then we'll conclude with uh, Jeff Gum, one of my partners, who's done some really interesting work on the economics of uh, treating these patients from uh, both the surgeon standpoint and from the hospital standpoint. Uh, so he'll, he'll give a, a ni really nice lecture on that. And hopefully we'll still have some time at the end uh, for a, a good panel discussion. Please feel free um, as the cases go up or as, during the presentations, if you have any questions, uh, to uh, send them in through the chat box, and we'll do our best to answer them. All right, so ju just a quick overview of vertebral osteomyelitis. Um, spinal infections can broadly be classified into three types. Uh, there's uh, hygienic, discitis, and osteomyelitis, which is uh, most common in the U.S., um, in a lot of the emerging world, uh, granulomatous osteomyelitis, uh, especially from TB, is very common. Um, and then also uh, epidural abscesses are some, something that we see a lot of here and that we treat and oftentimes can be associated with a pyogenic osteomyelitis. The incidence overall in the U.S. is about 2.5 per 100,000, but it's been gradually increasing uh, due to trends uh, such as the aging of the population, the obesity epidemic in our country, uh, as well as the opioid crisis, which uh, here in Kentucky we're kind of uh, in the center of. Uh, as we were talking uh, before the presentations, you know, there's been a lot of uh, work to try and uh, decrease prescription opioid use, but this has kind of led to a spike in, uh, in IV heroin use. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more osteomyelitis where we are because of that. Osteomyelitis can develop through one, through one of three pathways, uh, hematogenous seeding, um, direct inoculation from, say, an epidural or a microdiscectomy, or spread from contiguous soft tissues, such as a retropharyngeal abscess or a psoas abscess. Now, hematogenous seeding is definitely the most common mechanism. And if you look back, you know, the patients that we see in other published literature, uh, usually about half the time you can identify a septic event that happened uh, two, three, four months prior that probably led to the seeding of the spine, but sometimes you can't identify that. Oftentimes, uh, patients will report an episode of urosepsis or pneumonia. Um, as we all know, the intervertebral disc is avascular. It receives its nutrition from passive diffusion uh, from the adjacent end plates. So typically, these infections will start in the very uh, small low flow arterioles the, that supply these vascular end plates. And because it's low flow, it's an ideal environment for bacteria uh, to kind of set up. Uh, so oftentimes what happens is it'll begin in one end plate and then go through the disc and start to involve and destroy the disc, and then will spread into the adjacent end plate. So for the fellows out there, um, you know, oftentimes uh, when you have a consult in the hospital, something that looks like this, oftentimes, metastatic disease will be in the differential, but typically osteomyelitis, you'll see destruction of the disc, whereas in metastases, you'll see preservation of the disc. So that's kind of an important key thing to keep in mind. In terms of anatomic distribution, about 50% uh, of the time, these happen in the lumbar spine. 
about 20 to 30 percent of the time they happen in the thoracic spine and about 20 percent of the time they happen in the cervical spine. There are definitely patient groups that are uh, more susceptible to developing these infections. These include diabetics, basically uh, patients with systemic immunosuppression, such as diabetics, end-stage renal disease, organ transplant patients, patients with malignancy, and certainly uh, IV drug abuse has been a much more common um, common cause of this uh, lately in our center. When patients present clinically with a spinal infection, usually the most common uh, complaint is site-specific back pain, but constitutional symptoms are also, also oftentimes very common, such as fever, uh, chills, night sweats, malaise. On presentation, about 15 to 30% will have a neurologic deficit. And these patients can develop a neurologic deficit through one of two mechanisms. They can either have mechanical compression of the spinal cord from pus, bone fragments, disc fragments, or they can get a secondary vasculitis of the arterial supply to the spinal cord, leading to a secondary ischemia that way. When, uh, when we get one of these patients, uh, we have kind of have a standard battery of labs that we like to order. These include a CBC, uh, uh, an ESR, a C-reactive protein, and blood cultures. So going through, the, through these one by one, CBC is useful, but you have to keep in mind uh, that about 50% of these patients will not have an elevation of their white count. So a normal white blood cell count does not rule out osteomyelitis. Um, in contrast, the ESR and the CRP are almost universally elevated. And the CRP, in a lot of ways, is the most useful inflammatory marker because it changes most rapidly with treatment. So it often is what we follow when we, if we treat these patients conservatively with IV antibiotics, this is usually what we follow to assess their response to treatment. Blood cultures overall are positive about 50% of the time. Um, so again, they don't rule in or rule out infection, but if you get a positive blood culture, that gives you an organism which will help you tailor your antibiotics. So MRI uh, with contrast is obviously the imaging modality of choice. Uh, with infection, you'll see increased T2 signal in the disc and the adjacent vertebra, uh, and you'll see decreased T1 signal, um, as well as intense uptake of gadolinium contrast, oftentimes not only in the disc and the vertebra, but in the paravertebral soft tissues, such as in the retro retroperitoneal space or in the retropharyngeal space in a cervical case. Um, CT scan is important to look at the severity of the bone destruction, something that we tend to pay a lot of attention to is how destroyed the end plates are by the infection. When we see really advanced end plate destruction, that's something that, that tends to push us more towards surgical treatment. And CT scan is also uh, very helpful and important for planning fixation for surgery. Standing films have some, uh, some um, some utility in terms of uh, assessing alignment and stability, uh, but oftentimes, uh, you know, in terms of being a screening tool, you have to see about 30 to 40 percent destruction of the vertebral body before you really see anything on um, on plain X-rays. So here's an example of a discitis osteomyelitis. It's pretty obvious on uh, MRI, and I think the CAT scan really shows you how the extent of bony destruction is really kind of underappreciated on the MRI. So we tend to Basically, every patient that we get um, uh, following their MRI, they get a CAT scan shortly thereafter. So if blood cultures don't yield an organism, the next step in treatment is a CT-guided biopsy. Um, keep in mind that if antibiotics are started before this biopsy, uh, if they're not started before the biopsy, they'll, they'll yield an organism about 70% of the time. If, they, uh, if the patient has not been started on antibiotics, or if they have been started on antibiotics, then it's only uh, yields about 20% of the time. An important thing to keep in mind is that uh, patients with vertebral osteomyelitis, about 30% of the time, they can have a bacterial endocarditis. So at the very least, um, at the very least, I think a cardiology consult is warranted, um, if not an echocardiogram, but I usually leave that to the cardiologists. So most patients, uh, with, if they're caught early, can be treated with IV antibiotics alone. Not everybody needs surgery. Uh, we tend to uh, consult infectious disease early, and they will typically start the patients on broad-spectrum antibiotics. And then when either blood cultures or a CT-guided biopsy culture comes back, 
they'll switch to more organism-specific uh, antibiotics. Typically, uh, they'll be treated for 8 to 12 weeks uh, with IV antibiotics, depending on the virulence of the organism. And common organisms that we see um, uh, in osteomyelitis include, uh, in vertebral osteomyelitis, include Staph aureus, both MSSA and MRSA, as well as E. coli, coag-negative staph, propionum acnes uh, can sometimes be seen. So the classic indications for surgical treatment in vertebral osteomyelitis, number one, obviously, is failure of non-operative treatment, either clinically because their pain is just intractable, or they get IV antibiotics and their CRP and ESR are just not going down. Other indications include uh, if the infection has caused instability in the spine, deformity, uh, obviously, neurologic deficit is a strong indication for surgery, uh, and epidural abscess, in the absence of neurologic deficit, I'd say epidural abscess is a relative uh, indication for surgery. When we treat these uh, patients surgically, we have three basic goals of treatment. Number one is to debride the infective tissue, uh, the infected bone disc, to get it out of there to lower uh, the bacterial load. Um, number two uh, is to decompress the neural elements to uh, to either preserve or to improve their neurologic status, and, and third is to restore stability and alignment to the spine. The traditional surgical treatment, which we still tend to do very commonly, is we do an anterior debridement of the infected disc and bone, then we place an anterior strut graft. Usually we use a titanium mesh cage because of some of the bacteriostatic properties of titanium. And then we typically will give the patient anywhere from two to five days of IV antibiotics and then do a staged posterior instrumented fusion. And the theoretical basis for this treatment algorithm is that you're first debriding the necrotic infected tissue, lowering their bacterial load, and then you're allowing the, you're allowing the antibiotics uh, to work prior to placing uh, instrumentation. Now, having said that, there's been uh, some recent trends in treatment, uh, including doing same-day anterior and posterior treatment. Also, I think more and more people are starting to treat these posteriorly only. So for thoracic uh, cases, doing a thoracic vertebrectomy through a VCR type approach. Uh, for lumbar cases, doing a T-lift type approach. You know, most of the series that report on these techniques have been have been uh, small to medium-sized case series. So I think we still tend to uh, treat them more uh, you know, with our with the more traditional approach, but every once in a while. Um, so this is a case uh, of mine where the patient had a, a T7 osteomyelitis with pretty advanced uh, vertebral destruction. And uh, because the patient had very advanced COPD, we were worried about exposing him to a thoracotomy and we treated him with a uh, posterior vertebrectomy and instrumented fusion. Um, so definitely, you know, these posterior only approaches have uh, utility in certain cases. So basically that's just a quick overview. And now I'm gonna, um, have uh, Trey Crawford talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the new infectious disease guidelines that have come out with respect to vertebral infections. Great. Uh, thanks, Lawton. Let's see here if I can. Control. Go ahead and click the screen. It should start advancing. It does advance. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts uh, in our local clinical experience about these IDESA guidelines. Uh, as some of you may know, I spent uh, several years working on practice guidelines with both the Scoliosis Research Society and the North American Spine Society. Uh, so when these IDSA guidelines uh, were published in 2015, I had a particular interest in trying to apply them to our local clinical practice. And like all practice guidelines, um, they're ideally based on the published medical literature. Uh, but as we all know, um, high level evidence is frequently missing uh, for many of our important clinical questions and therefore expert opinion is often substituted. Um, so that's the case with this guideline as well. Um, but if nothing else, I believe that these practice guidelines can be a good starting point to summarize the current best available evidence and point us towards uh, future areas of research uh, as we continuously seek to answer these questions and improve the care of our patients. Now, so if you're not familiar with these guidelines, this manuscript is actually uh, freely downloadable. I just searched for it on the internet and was able to download it uh, from a website. I encourage you to take a closer look at the details, uh, but right now I just have five minutes so I'm gonna to try to hit the highlights 
uh, and just make some comments about our local experience. So this uh, executive summary uh, defined uh, native vertebral osteomyelitis as he hematogenous seeding in an adjacent disc that progresses to osteomyelitis of the spine. So as Dr. Drosovic just said, that's the most common presentation of a spine infection that we'll see clinically. Uh, the diagnosis and treatment is often delayed due to the nonspecific nature of the presenting symptoms, uh, which are often attributed to the more common uh, degenerative spine pathologies. And believe me, I've, I've actually been burned on this personally uh, by a patient that I've seen in the office. Um, you know, it seems like the patient's presenting with a very typical degenerative pathology. Turns out later that they had a spine infection. And if the, there's a delay in diagnosis, that can lead to a, a less than ideal outcome. So if I have any suspicion in the office, if things just don't seem to be add, adding up, if they have red flags, if they have risk factors, I'll send them for a same day ESR and CRP just straight out of the office. Because uh, MRIs are often required to establish the definitive diagnosis but they're often delayed due to scheduling and insurance approval uh, hurdles uh, that we all experience. Don't know if I'm actually, let's see here. Sorry, I think I lost control of the slides there for a second. So the guideline also states um, that except in septic patients or patients with the neurologic compromise, empiric antimicrobial therapy should be withheld until a uh, microbiologic diagnosis is confirmed with the image guided biopsy. Uh, so locally, we've been requesting our interventional radiologist to perform a CT guided biopsy. Um, and sometimes these, these uh, culture results will be positive. I think uh, Dr. Drosovic uh, reported 70% success rate if they have not had antibiotics yet. Uh, but unfortunately, some of these patients do receive antibiotics uh, at outside institutions before they get to us um, or, or even in our institution before we're consulted. And so there's a fairly high rate of negative biopsy cultures, uh, which can be frustrating. Uh, the guideline also says that it, the infection is commonly monomicrobial. So it's from a single organism, and it's usually most commonly from Staph aureus. So if the patient's had a staph aureus bloodstream infection within the previous three months, the guideline says that we do not need to do a disc space aspiration. Um, so if we're lucky, when these patients come to us, come to our institution, they've had a positive blood culture or a, uh, at an outside hospital or, or at our hospital, and that makes things a lot easier. Uh, but certainly if the blood cultures have not been done by the time we see the patient, we'll order the blood cultures. And hopefully we can get those done before the patients get antibiotics and we can get a positive uh, culture res uh, result. Um, so the guideline uh, states that the majority of patients are cured with a six week course of antimicrobial therapy. So it's a little bit different than what Dr. Drosovic said. We said eight to 12 weeks. So obviously there's a little bit of a wiggle room in the ID literature. Um, unfortunately, failures do occur, and we, we've seen our share of these, and we're going to show at least one case example in our cases that we'll show in a minute. Um, but, you know, I think the big unanswered questions for us are what, what percent of patients fail uh, IV antibody therapy, and can we do a better job of predicting who will fail? You know, some of our local hypotheses that we've come up with in our conferences include uh, higher risk with uh, intravenous drug abuse patients, patients that are on dialysis, patients that have a positive MRSA culture. Um, so I think it's important for us as spine surgeons to work with our infectious disease colleagues uh, to be clear about who's responsible for monitoring these patients um, and, and making sure that these patients don't follow through, fall through the cracks uh, when they're on IV antibiotic therapy. Um, so the guideline uh, also states that indications for surgery uh, is the development of neurologic deficits, symptoms of spinal cord compression, uh, or evidence of progression or occurrence of the infection despite appropriate antibiotic treatment. Um, so it states that most patients can be followed symptomatically by monitoring the CRP and the SED rate, and that repeat imaging should only be done when patients fail to show clinical and lab improvement. Um, so I think that although we're tempted as surgeons to repeat MRIs and repeat CT scans, and sometimes these will actually look worse um, over time, that if patients are doing well clinically and their labs are looking okay, 
infectious disease doctors believe that we should not repeat the imaging and we should just follow them clinically. Um, so that's something that uh, I think uh, we need to learn more about as time goes on. Uh, so in summary, I think the future opportunities for us and, and for you guys out there, and, and honestly, if you have an interest in researching some of this, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we've been trying to work on some of this locally, and I'd be happy to do some multi-center stuff. Uh, but we need to figure out if there's ways to get a better uh, biopsy yield, to get more positive cultures, uh, so we can tailor the antibiotic therapy and not and, and not do this broad spectrum antibiotic treatment for everybody. Um, we also need to figure out uh, how to best monitor these patients. How frequently do they need to be seen? Uh, who does that best? How frequently to repeat their labs? Do we really need to repeat imaging on some patients? And when do we do that? Um, I think improving compliance, especially in our IV drug using uh, population, is is extremely important. Uh, they have an extremely high non-compliance rate, as you can imagine. Um, and we've actually we're, we're, we've submitted a manuscript recently showing uh, that when patients get a neurologic deficit, um, it's very rare that they get full recovery. Um, so it's very important that you recognize this early, get to these patients early before they develop a significant neurologic deficit. And I think that long-term outcomes are really just unknown in this population and how much kyphosis is acceptable. Uh, what about other post-infectious uh, deformities? Um, I think they're all uh, great uh, areas for future research. So hopefully this was, was helpful for you. I think we'll be able to talk in more detail as we go through the cases. And I'll try to keep the program moving here. Pass it on to the next person, Dr. Geddes. I appreciate it, Trey. That great job. Um, so our first uh, fellow presenter is Dr. Ben Geddes. He uh, comes to us from the Yale Residency Program, and he's going off to practice in three weeks uh, at the Center for Sports Medicine and Orthopedics in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So Ben, take it away. Ben, you may be muted. You want to check it? Sorry. Can you hear me now? All right, perfect. Well, thanks, Dr. Drosovic. I have the privilege of going over our first case here. Um, it's a 31-year-old female who was transferred from an outside hospital. Um, the chief complaint at the outside hospital was low back pain. Um, it had been present for about a week, and it started... Um, there was a history of a fall, though it was a little bit hard to correlate with the start of the symptoms. Um, ultimately had bilateral leg weakness and numbness, and then slowly progressed to upper extremity symptoms as well. The patient had been seen in an outside uh, emergency room about two days prior and was worked up and was sent home with pain medications. Um, pertinent medical history, uh, hepatitis C and a history of IV drug abuse. Um, on our exam, uh, the patient had three out of five strength in all muscle groups in both uh, bilateral upper and lower extremities to Asia C type presentation. Um, sensation was intact, but there was some decreased sensation um, below the umbilicus um, and distally. Um, there was positive Hoffman's bilaterally. The patient uh, was febrile at 104 in our emergency room. And also they couldn't void and uh, a straight cath yielded 900 cc's of urine. So um, because they presented with this back pain initially, the outside hospital imaging that we had was um, of the lumbar spine, which was clean. You can see here with a plain film and an MRI. Um, when they came to us, we because of the upper extremity symptoms, we started to work up the cervical spine and got some x-rays, which were um, underwhelming. And then went ahead to get an MRI. Um, this is a sagittal cut here, obviously. And a T2 image shows that there's this ventral epidural collection in the cervical spine. It goes across several levels. Um, on the next uh, cut here, this is a contrast enhanced imaging, and you can see that that ventral rim of um, brightness that shows the edge of the epidural abscess. This is just a representation of two of the more stenotic levels at C5, 6, and 6, 7. And again, you see that ventral mass occupying collection, and uh, there's some cord signal change as well. As Dr. Drosovic was talking about, our protocol is to get a CT scan to look for any bony involvement, which um, you can see here, it's, it's pretty clean. So it doesn't look like there's any kind of erosive changes. So our diagnosis for this is it was epidural abscess. Um, it extended from C4 to T2. 
There was ventral cord compression with edema um, with no significant bony destruction. There was some prevertebral extension, which we saw in the MRI. Um, so our plan, this isn't exactly the, you know, our plan was to kind of give what the pathology gave us. Ultimately, we had to take a pretty aggressive path um, and did a C5 to T1 antivertebrectomy and then followed it up posteriorly two days later with a C3 to T4. And the main reason for that is how extensive it was and how loculated the collection was. It was really hard to irrigate or sweep out the collection through, you know, ACDF type approaches. Um, so you can see here, this is after stage one. We used an expandable cage, obviously quite a long um, length that was uh, spanned. And then we used two kick plates, one at the top and one at the bottom. And then this next image just shows um, what was done uh, in stage two, which is a posterior spinal fusion. Ultimately, we took cultures and it came back MSSA, so uh, which was a good thing. So we were able to put them on IV nafcillin for six weeks. Uh, ID was involved. In terms of neurologic improvement, this patient um, currently is still in Asia C, didn't have a lot of improvement, which um, we thought was interesting because we have seen some dramatic improvements in some of these epidural abscess patients. And our thought is that maybe there's a vascular component, not just a direct compression component. Um, because they seem to do better than, say, a traumatic injury. Uh, but this patient, unfortunately, did not have a much neurologic improvement. Thank you. Great job. Um, our next presenter... Thank you, Ben. Very nice job. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Aiden Kashigar, uh, who comes to us from the residency program at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. He's going to practice uh, at the Nevada Orthopedic and Spine Center uh, in Las Vegas next year. Go ahead, Aiden. Hi, everybody. And thank you for uh, joining us today. So I have the honor of presenting the second case. I don't think I have controls yet. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the second case is a spine service console that was given to us by the Chief of Infectious Disease Services, 43-year-old uh, mother of two, wife of a local radiologist, uh, with initial workups done in an outside facility. And the initial workup was worrisome for a thoracic spine infection. Admitted to our hospital for further workup. Uh, ER visit was on January 2020, two months after original presentation uh, with worsening thoracic back pain. Uh, no neuro neurological symptoms, no radicular symptoms, and a past medical history of diabetes type 1 with HbA1c of 7.2. Physical examination was unremarkable, a febrile, vital signs stable, but uh, all the inflammatory markers were elevated with a CRP of 8.3 on presentation. Uh, this is an upright x-ray of the thoracic spine showing that at the T8 level that there is area of sclerosis and that was only finding on the x-ray. You can see it in the middle here. CT scan better visualizes the sclerotic area, which is on the right pedicle and the right vertebral body side, along with an adjacent area of lucency in the T7, T8 uh, region in the T8 vertebral body. Uh, these are select slides on the right side of the vertebra showing better the sclerotic area. Here you can see a T1 fat suppression MRI sagittal with contrast uh, showing the T7 and T8 vertebral bodies affected as well as uh, collection in the left uh, paravertebral area. Again, select cuts around there is uh, sclerosis showing no uptakes, no, no fluid in the sclerotic region. And so our differential diagnosis at the top uh, was uh, the bacterial infection. Uh, I think I've skipped one of the uh, slides where we discussed that there is a previous history of skin infections uh, in June of 2019 that was treated by uh, a peripheral uh, doctor and also the history of diabetes. The second thing in the differential was fungal infection. Um, and I think it was one of the slides that was missed uh, at the beginning. A patient uh, lives in a farm with uh, multiple different animals. And so blastomycosis was one of the uh, top components in the differential for a fungal infection. Of course, with any infection, you're also considering tumor. And this area of sclerosis, uh, our thoughts were that potentially it's a bony island versus a Brody's abscess with a very slow uh, growing infection uh, causing bony sclerosis uh, over time. 
Blood cultures were negative, TB test was negative, and IR biopsy was performed showing MRSA, and patient was discharged home on IV daptomycin. After six weeks of IV daptomycin, the back pain improved, but patient returned two weeks after the uh, completion of the daptomycin with worsening uh, mid-back pain. Again, no neurological symptoms, no radicular symptoms, no constitutional symptoms, and neurologically intact. Uh, all inflammatory markers were again elevated with a CRP of 2.3, white blood cell of 12.2, and blood cultures again negative. Here you can see worsening sclerosis, uh, worsening collapse of the T8 vertebral body with a focal kyphosis, measuring 18.7. And so here you have a presentation of a patient that has failed a six week course of IV antibiotic with worsening bony destruction, ongoing recurrent infection. And as such, we here are recommending surgical debridement and reconstruction. Uh, this is done through a staged approach, stage one being a left thoracotomy through a sixth rib takedown, anterior T7 and T8 corpectomy as well as placement of an interbody device, and stage two being a posterior fusion from T4 to T11. Interop cultures uh, grew MRSA and interop biopsy as suspected benign appearing cortical bone consistent with the bone ions. Here you can see the immediate post-op films showing the cage as well as the posterior instrumentation. Patient was sent home on vancomycin this time for six weeks, followed by oral doxycycline for three months. Clinically improved, a follow-up is ongoing, and these are the last films in clinic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aiden. And then um, our next uh, speaker is Dr. John Dimar, who's one of my partners. He's got a wonderful talk on uh, surgical approaches and uh, offers some technical pearls for the fellows. Uh, when they start to encounter these in their practice. John? Can I ask a quick question? Yes. This is more technical. Um, it's an excellent, you know, construct. Do you, what, did you use image guidance or what, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of system did you use there? Was it freehand or was it image guided or robotic or what? Yes, so, so that's, that's my case. Um, so for the anterior uh, part, we, did, we just used x-ray, uh, but for the uh, posterior part, we did use uh, navigation, CT-based navigation. Did that answer your question? We also had a few ch questions in the chat room about uh, uh, biologics. I think we, we tend to use uh, BMP on a lot of these cases uh, because of the rapid fusion that it tends to that it tends to give and the thoracic spine oftentimes with a thoracotomy you're going to get local rib graft uh, which is an excellent graft material uh, but just wanted to kind of answer that that was a common question in the chat room all right John Maladin before you go oh yes is it BMP alone or BMP and the cancellous chips um, cancellous chips to bulk it up I think it, that's a little bit Surgeon dependent, I tend to just use BMP. I think uh, other folks will use cancellous chips uh, if they need to, if they have a large cavity that they need to fill. Um, I think it depends on the requirements of the, of the specific case. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right, John. John, you might be on mute still. All right, I'm here. Okay. I'm John Dimar. I'm one of the staff at, at the Leatherman. Uh, knowing anterior approaches, I think, is very essential to doing these cases. It's very difficult, except perhaps with a costal transversectomy, to do these, particularly in the lumbar spine, where they're most common, without having a, a, a knowledge of this and everything. So let's see if we can get it to advance here. Here we go. Basically, the indications are for anterior surgery are essentially when the pathology is anterior. Anterior, so I think you really need to have a good understanding of the anterior column. It's useful for all of these things listed here. We're specifically going to talk about destructive processes, tuberculosis, pyogenic infections, uh, tumors, and all these other things such as fusion boost and deformities are also common uses of it. But it's really important that you get with one of your uh, uh, surgeons and really become familiar with this, these approaches yourself and know the anatomy. Anterior surgery has much less muscle trauma, often less blood loss, reduced OR times. You get much better visualization of the vertebral body, the infection, the disc. 
you get much improved fusion rates when you go anteriorly, particularly when combined with a front and back procedure, and you can restore alignment very nicely, even with osteomyelitis. Biomechanically, it makes the construct much stronger. Uh, you get a bigger footprint for your cages to place them than you do with a posterly applied cages in many cases. You can simply get a more beefy cage in there, and you can thoroughly debride the area and, and really improve the, the strength of the construct when combined with posterior instrumentation. There are complications, vascular injuries, bowel laceration, ureter injuries, but with good expertise and, 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 and practice doing these cases, all of these are relatively low and can actually, you can actually improve the outcomes by doing the anterior surgery. The biggest uh, uh, thing against a lot of anterior approaches was a lot of older surgeons would do these very extensile thoracolumbar approaches and damage the abdominal wall, and there's a lot of pooching and chronic pain with these patients. We have not found this to be a problem. Uh, the main problem is if you do these, you'll cut the T11 and 12 nerves, which innervate the abdominal wall, and if you do focus mini approaches uh, to do various segments of the spine, you'll avoid this problem on almost every case. We actually looked at this. We looked at a whole series of almost 200 patients where we did anterior surgery and looked at the patient's appreciation of the wound and our appreciation, and most importantly, pain outcomes. And uh, we used a standardized uh, methodology. As you can see here, it's a, it's a standardized, validated anterior abdominal wall surgery uh, 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 metric that we can use, and we distribute it to all the patients. And we really found that there wasn't much difference in all these different wound uh, characteristics, and particularly what we want to look at was with pain, the pain domain is basically by three months and even relatively shortly after surgery, these patients really reported no abdominal wall pain and we really didn't have a lot of hernia problems with our focused mini incisions that we do. So we'll look at anterior retroperitoneal approaches and transabdominal approaches. Basically, you want to know your anatomy, you want to look at your x-rays ahead of time. Some people like to do bowel preps, you need to know your levels as far as where the discs sit as far as the pelvic brim. And you want to plan your surgery ahead of time, whether you need one surgery, two surgeries, whether you want to do a transabdominal or retroperitoneal, how many levels. So you want to do some preoperative plannings on these patients. It's really critical. There's really three basic approaches to treating an osteomyelitis or, or most of these. This is a transabdominal, which uh, basically um, you're looking at just treating L5S1, good for simple discitis. A paramedian, which you can do a much more extensile approach from L3 to L5. And of course, the lateral muscle splitting approach. Uh, where you can go higher up uh, all the way up to uh, the spine. So this is a transabdominal. You split the linea alba. You pack the bowels out of the way. You place your retractors. A Thompson retractor is a godsend for these procedure. You open up the posterior peritoneum here, and you can easily approach the disc. And for simple discitis or without a lot of destructive end plate changes, this is a, a fine procedure. The retroperitoneal approach is the workhorse for us. We use this a lot from L4 to the sacrum. You can do either a fan and steel or a vertical incision. You uh, bump the patient up, as you can see here. Uh, basically, you split the rectus sheath. You pull the uh, rectus uh, muscle to the side. As you can see here, you'll actually see the transversalis fascia, which you can detach from the lateral wall. And we'll show you a video of that in a little bit. And move right along uh, the posterior flank, as you can see here, and push all the abdominal contents toward the midline until you find the psoas. And then you go anti-psoas, and you'll easily slip into the, into the vertebral body and the disc spaces and the various vascular structures. Uh, you also can, of course, go right between the peritoneum, right, right, right retroperitoneal, and go right to the 5-1 disc space at, between the bifurcation. And you can mobilize the left vascular pedicle with vessel loops and actually uh, mobilize and get up higher. Once you uh, ligate the middle sacral artery, in this particular case, you can, again, take the disc out just like the transabdominal approach and treat the L5-S1 disc space, as you can see here. So we'll go into a video here. Uh, this is going to be the paramedian approach. To L4, 5, and 5, 1. Standard, we're going to make a midline incision here, as you can see. Uh, a lot of times, uh, depending on how obese the patient is, uh, various levels of retractors can be placed. There's about every two or three inches, there'll be a large segmental uh, 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 vessel going into the fat that you have to just hemoclip coming out of the rectus. Here you can see the rectus muscle, uh, uh, basically a medials to the top, and we're going to pull that to the side here in a second and you'll be able to see the transversalis fascia to the top and a little bit of retroperitoneal fat to the bottom, which will uh, basically detach now. Now we're gonna move retroperitoneally and pull all the fat and sweep it toward the midline off of the psoas. You could actually see the psoas there uh, at the end of the bovi tip right here. He's outlining it. The general uh, femoral nerve is sitting right on 
the front of that tendinous band there. And medial to this, of course, you're going to isolate out, and he's going to point this out in a little bit, uh, the um, ureter right there. The, the left iliac pedicle is going to be just lateral to it here. This, this would be much more spectacular if you want to blow it up on a bigger screen. Now, um, what we're going to do is, is, uh, is uh, he's going to point out again, there's the general femoral nerve. And here on the left side toward the bottom, um, I don't know what happened there. Uh-oh. Hang on here. Sorry. Technical difficulty. We'll play this here. What we really want to do is the left iliac uh, vein comes here, and we're pointing out at the end of the sucker there, the iliolumbar vein, which goes off at 90 degrees. You can see the blueness of it there. And you have to ligate that or you tear it. Up at the top there under his middle finger, that's the L4-5 disc space. So you can see we're moving up along the lateral side, anterior to the psoas, along the disc space right there. Right there's the disc space he's pointing out. And we're going to ligate the segmentals across there, including the other lumbar vein at L5, so we can pull the vascular structures toward the midline and get into our disc spaces anterior laterally. This is really kind of a, what they do with the OLIF procedure. Now you can see the tie is around that iliolumbar vein. You can see the main left iliac vein going off to the left there. And we tie this down and this really helps us uh, uh, prevent any uh, uh, tearing of it, which can bleed quite a lot. And then we'll really have control of all the vascular structures and we can really outline our disc spaces as you see here. So we're gonna tie that off in just a second here. So that's the basic retroperitoneal approach. You can see here we're now going into the disc space and then we can do whatever work we need to do to drain pus or anything. So we'll also do a muscle splitting approach. This is what we tend to use um, on the lateral side to go into L1 down through L4-5. You don't cut the muscles, you split them along, along their fascia. Here's a little bit of, of showing you diagrammatically. You, you cut the fascia of the external oblique. You move 90 degrees and cut the fascia of the internal oblique and mobilize it off of the transversalis fascia below. Now you, you Split the transversalis fascia, you can see the retroperitoneal fat peak into view, and you'll sweep that from right to left until you identify the psoas muscle. You go anisoas in front of the psoas, and you'll come right down on the disc spaces and the sigmental arteries and veins. So we show you some examples here. These are a little bit stretched because of the formatting at the center there, but basically we're gonna transect the um, um, external black muscle here. You can see it right there on the right side. Here we're just below the rib, so we took a little bit of the rib head out. And here you can clearly see the external oblique muscle. Um, we're outlining it. That's the internal oblique. And running up and down across there is one of the, is the T11 or T12 uh, nerve root that innervates the muscle that you do not want to cut. So that's the external oblique. And here we're going to excise the external oblique next. And we're going to come down to the uh, transversalis fascia. And we'll come in. This is the Thompson retractor, which you should get if you're going to do these approaches. It eliminates at least two to three medical students that you need to do the approach. And here you can see the transversalis fascia that we've excised. Now you see the retroperitoneal fat. We're gonna sweep that off the lateral abdominal wall until we get to uh, the, the psoas muscle and go anisoas. And as you can see here on the right, we're gonna, there's the retroperitoneal fat that I'm talking about. That'll be swept forward uh, toward the umbilicus and the midline. In a second here, there's the general femoral nerve coming down through there. And finally, uh, the, the Thompson retractor is placed. We've readjusted it to pull the uh, psoas muscle back. And now you're going to really, you'll see the psoas muscle running from right to left as it goes down the, the anterior lateral aspect of the vertebral bodies, as you see there. And finally, you see once we have the psoas pulled uh, toward the bottom of the screen, you can now see a disc where we've inserted a cage and everything. So this is the basic lateral muscle splitting approach that we use to approach almost all these osteomyelitis uh, cases, and it's really worthwhile to know it. So just to sum everything up, there's the external oblique that's been incised and mobilized off the internal oblique muscle. Here we're splitting the internal oblique, and now we're looking at the transversalis fascia with the nerve right in the middle, which you don't want to transect or you'll get a hernia. Here we're, we're basically, there you can see the nerve on the transversalis fascia really quite well. Here we've opened it up and you can see the retroperitoneal fat. Uh, we're mobilizing the fat off until we find the beautiful source muscle on this 
with the top of it being at the top, and then we pull it to the back and we can do our work. So we'll look at an actual case. This is an actual osteomyelitis case and finish up with that. 4 year old female uh, came from the same area where a lot of the cases you've been seeing uh, around our area. Uh, basically, she works at a very uh, national chain restaurant as the manager serving your food every day. And she's an IV Opana drug user and has had back pain now for almost three or four months and has continued to work. You can see the bone destruction here. You can see that it, there is some involvement of the canal, but most of it seems to be contained. She's uh, almost developing a a, 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 a somewhat of a bony shell around this. You see this a lot. It's almost like an involucrum in a way that you used to see around fingers. On the MRI scan, you see this really extensive destruction of all the disc and loss of normal lumbar lordosis here. You can also see it's very important with these with these osteomyelitis cases, extensive inflammation of the surrounding soft muscle and soft tissues, which in early ones is a dead giveaway for early osteomyelitis. You see all the destruction. You see both muscles are extensively involved with this. Not an abscess yet. So here we're going to approach this in a similar fashion. You can see that the head is at the top, the foot is at the bottom. That's the sous muscle to the right. He's pointing out the general femoral nerve, the ureter is to the left here, and we're gonna open an interval here and basically get into this, into this infection. So basically you can see the L4-5 disc above and below, the left iliac artery, we've completely mobilized this and put a vascular tape around it so we can move and get it between the bifurcation and above it because we have to go all the way up to the bottom of L3 to get this out of here. Here's the psoas muscle. You can see the disc base at the bottom, the left iliac vein on the left. We're looking, the head is of course to the top. And basically we're gonna mobilize that. Now you can really see how we've mobilized the vein with the artery and the vein there, and we're gonna slip a cage to replace after we've done a corpectomy and removed all the debris from the dead bone and, and expand it up. And now we're pulling the vascular pedicle uh, toward the midline here. I hope that is clear to everybody. And then uh, now we set everything in place and expanded the cage. And we can do some pretty remarkable things with these osteomyelitis cases and save people's lives in there. And here's the cage expanded. You can see we've restored low doses on this patient. And then we stabilize it posteriorly. We always recommend, of course, low here to, to do iliolumbar fixation. And of course, it grew out in this case, MSSA, which may be why it wasn't quite as virulent as an MRSA uh, case. So that's the basic anatomy and then a case of how to approach these osteomyelitis cases. One caveat is a lot of times they're more stuck down than this, and it's a little bit more difficult to mobilize the soft tissue. But knowing the basic anatomy and practicing on normal cases will allow you to, to basically step up to the more difficult cases. Thank you. Any questions? That was tremendous, John. Great, great pictures and great video. Uh, you know, these are these are not straightforward approaches, even at baseline. But oftentimes, you know, what, what he kind of um, underemphasizes how distorted the anatomy is sometimes in these cases. And uh, you know, those are those are just some great pictures. Thanks, John. If you, if you know the normal anatomy, when it's not very apparent, you'll be able to find it better. So. Yep. All right. Now our next presenter is uh, John Buza. He's uh, another one of our fellows who comes to us from the NYU residency program. And he is going back to New York uh, to practice at New York Presbyterian in uh, Queens. John? All right. Thank you very much. I have our third case this evening. This is a 55-year-old female. She had no significant past medical history. She underwent a left ankle fracture ORAF six months prior. She presented with left ankle septic arthritis to an outside hospital where she underwent IND and removal of hardware. Her cultures were positive for MRSA and she was started on IV vank. Um, however, despite that treatment, she, be, she became progressively ill. Uh, her white blood cell count was 42,000. Her ESR was elevated and she was transferred to our institution for back pain and worsening medical condition. So uh, on exam, uh, she was tender over her cervical thoracic and thoracic junction, but she was otherwise neurovascularly intact. These are her initial uh, radiographs demonstrating her trimalleolar ankle fracture. She underwent ORIF with a podiatrist, and she continued to have ankle pain for several months after uh, this fixation, and she was kind of just being followed uh, clinically. But if you look closely here, you do see some sprue loosening and some periosteal reaction suggested a possible chronic uh, osteo. And then by the time she had presented to the outside hospital, she had significant soft tissue swelling and an abscess. So she underwent removal of hardware. And then at the outside hospital, she had a CT chest abdomen pelvis. 
And really the early clue to what was going on here, the only thing you can see here is that she has some asymmetric enlargement of her right paraspinal muscle with a possible abscess there. So, uh, and you can better appreciate that on this CT of her lumbar spine. So when she presented to us, we obtained an MRI of her entire spine with and without contrast. You can see she does have a pre, you know, some prevertebral infection and she does have a small epidural abscess, cervical epidural abscess that's not particularly compressive. She also has a thoracic epidural abscess, but what you really start to appreciate is this large loculated uh, paraspinal abscess um, in her right paraspinal muscle and it extends from her thoracic spine all the way down to her lumbar spine. And it appears to be kind of uh, spilling out of this facet joint, her right L4, L5 facet joint. So uh, at this point, we got blood cultures, which were again, positive for MRSA. She was neurologically intact, but systemically she was very sick. If you look below, um, her white blood cell count was 42,000. So we decided to take her to the uh, operating room to do an IND of her paraspinal muscle and not address the epidural abscess at this time. So here's an intraoperative video. You can see we made a uh, small incision. This is over her lumbar spine. You can see we found the infection here. Huh. I hope nobody's eat eating dinner. Pretty impressive. And then, and then what we did is we made a separate incision over her thoracic spine. And you can see we're just incising the uh, fascia here. And this, this uh, infection essentially extended all the way from T1 um, almost down to her sacrum. It was very extensive. We're kind of spreading there. You can see there's much more uh, pus coming out. And then from there, we, um, you know, obviously suctioned, we, uh, Suction, we were essentially able to create a track from that, from our thoracic incision down to the lumbar incision. And then we passed a red rubber catheter through that. And then we were able to uh, pulse lavage um, through that space to clear as much of that infection as possible. Um, so she was treated uh, with six weeks of IV vancomycin. Her inflammatory markers normalized and she remained neurologically intact. She got an MRI three, I think this is just three days after surgery. And you can see that in her thoracic spine, her abscess is starting to resolve, uh, as well as in the lumbar spine. And then she got a repeat MRI four months after surgery. And this is her thoracic spine. You can see the abscess is gone. Uh, and similar uh, picture in the lumbar spine. So she clinically improved and did very well. That's it. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, so definitely a little bit stomach turning, but a great case. Um, and then uh, now uh, we've got Jeff Gum, who's one of my partners, who's uh, doing a lot of really interesting work on the uh, economics of spine care, and he's got some uh, interesting data on uh, vertebral osteomyelitis. Jeff? Yeah, thanks, Milan. All right. Kind of as expected, uh, I'm going to zip through a few of them to try to catch up. Next time we're going to tell Dimar that he has half the time available than what he really has. Great, great talk though, John. Great talk. All right. So as Milan and uh, Dimar had mentioned, we really live in the heart of the opioid epidemic. And no matter how you dice the stats, they're all pretty impressive. If you look at a regional map of deaths per 100,000 patients related to opioids, uh, we're very close to really the epicenter of where this is uh, hitting our country. Uh, there's a small county about 30 minutes north of us called Scott County that's landed in Time Magazine at least twice, if not three or four times over the past four or five years. And the main reason for that is the, the IV drug use is just really out of proportion. In about a six-month span in 2014, there were 200 HIV cases out of a county of 4,400 patients or 4,400 people, so pretty high HIV infection rate. When I started my practice in 14, pretty quickly, I realized pretty much every weekend we, we would get some sort of case like this that we had to operatively take care of. And so I became interested in 
you know, the numbers and the economics behind this. And, you know, not all press is good press or not all PR is good PR, but here's our hospital touting us as the heroin center. And uh, pretty quickly, a lot of these patients, if not all these patients, uh, regionally were shipped into us to take care of. And our typical clinical experience is, you know, at, uh, as Trey uh, mentioned, they present with a, uh, a lot of times with a significant motor impairment, a lot farther along the clinical pathway than uh, a non-IV drug user. A lot of times they're difficult to deal with in the hospital. We've had several patients caught in the hospital shooting up in the bathrooms uh, uh, prior to surgery or after surgery. Length of stay seems to be longer. They're always difficult to place or disposition. You can't give them extended IV access. They, they love that if they get a pick line and they get sent out of the hospital because it's easy access for them. So we avoid that. They're always non-compliant for the most part and uh, they don't follow up whether that's good or bad. If you look at our numbers, uh, as expected, the trend from 13 to 17, that's, that's a time interval or time horizon that we looked at our data. Um, 16 was really the peak, right? So between surgical patients, non-surgical patients, and IV drug users and non-IV drug users, 16 was really the peak of this. If you break down the IV drug use patients, again, operative and non-operative patients uh, seem to peak in 2016. One thing to note, our non-operative numbers are actually quite a bit lower than uh, what we're finding now. Retrospectively, these patients are not easy to identify. We've actually tried using predictive analytics or text analytics within the EPIC system. And because of the combination of words, it's not easy to identify those patients. So our non-surgical numbers are definitely underrepresented. If you look at the uh, total number of cases, um, uh, the surgery side was definitely favored again because we can't identify the non-surgical ones very well, at least at the time. Um, 16 again was the peak with 61 over operative cases, overall operative cases in 16. If you look at the demographic profile, uh, the majority were males. Drug use was as high as 35 percent. Um, alcohol abuse was between five and seven. Uh, about a third of them had diabetes and most of the time uncontrolled and in-stage renal disease and hepatitis C very, very high in this population as expected. If you look at the radiographic profile, um, we went through radiographs for uh, about 300 of these patients. Uh, again, pretty consistent with the literature, disc involvement only favored uh, uh, non-operative patients, right? So that they're not as far as long uh, along on the clinical pathway. If they have both vertebral bodies involved or an epidural abscess, the majority of those patients underwent uh, an, an operative treatment versus non-operative treatment. So my interest in the cost or the economics behind this is when, when you're clinically trying to take care of these patients, it, it felt like they were just... Uh, a massive resource use for the hospital system. And, I, and our hypothesis was they really consumed a lot of dollars um, to take care of them. And what we found, it's not exactly the case, but it depends on your cohort you're compa comparing to. So total charges in the non-operative cohort, and these are broken down between drug use and non-drug use, was pretty similar amongst the two. On the drug abuse patients or drug uses, about $1,000 more on the actual cost. And these are not Medicare allowable dollars. These are actual dollars our hospitals spend across all these different service lines. Length of stay was a little bit longer, but not much longer. If you look at the surgery side of things, it, again, uh, not as we expected, but the total variable cost, the actual cost incurred was a little bit cheaper uh, compared to the non-drug abuse patients. And if you break down um, all the other service lines involved, uh, uh, there was really nothing significant between the drug use and non-drug use patients. And so between 12 and 17, we saw a drastic increase in cases, about a 12-fold increase in surgical patients. IV drug use seemed to be a significant contribution to this, especially in our area. We've, uh, we've noticed that it started to decrease or plateau, at least in 2017. Disc involvement was more likely in, or disc only involvement in non-surgical epidural abscess and uh, both vertebral bodies was more likely surgical. Cost was similar for both these, but if you break down the non-IV drug cohort, those are older patients on average about 12 years older comparing to the drug use cohort. They're more frail, extensive comorbidities. And so if you compare, if you try to compare apples to apples, we took the most common DRGs that these IV drug use patients fell into and compared them to non-osteo or non-IV drug use cases. And those, in that situation, IV drug use did drive up the cost significantly. So um, in the most common DRG, it was 19,000 versus 17,000. Um, and the other DRGs, we were all uh, elevated in patients that were taking, that were IV drug users. So 
Overall, when comparing more similar cases, IV drug use does appear to increase the cost of care, which is uh, our initial hypothesis. Future directions, we want to confirm that we're still trending down, which is really uh, a reflection of our community uh, uh, taking care of these difficult patients. We, we, want, we do want to look a little more in disposition status and uh, confirm that IV drug use is at risk for non-compliance in the late presentation, which we all expect. And the most important thing for this project, uh, at least in my mind, was to utilize this data to better improve care pathways, right? So these patients don't just need surgical treatment shipped off to a PT or some sort of nursing home. They need a drug rehabilitation. They need support. They need counseling, social services in the hospital and outside the hospital. And so as we dissect the numbers, uh, we're better, uh, we're able to better improve these care pathways and, and, and really help these patients more from just a surgical perspective. So I know it's quick, but uh, I was trying to make up a little time so we have a little time to discuss. Thanks, guys. That was great, guys. This was really a wonderful uh, topic and, and great talks and discussion. We have, uh, it's about eight o'clock and normally we end at eight, but if anybody has any burning questions for any of the Leatherman group, fire them off. I, I particularly like the one of the uh, the pus coming out of the wound. That was really good. Thankfully, I ate dinner before this, but uh, <laughs> it reminded me of my internship days. I haven't seen anything like that in a long, long time. <laughs> well, if there's guys, no more questions. So, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that's probably the best uh, one hour on education of uh, vertebral osteo that I've had in my career. So uh, it's a great instructional course. So thank you very much, guys. That was uh, extraordinarily well orchestrated. And you used up most of your resources. <laughs> so you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, you guys did much. great. And did not thank disappoint. You. Take care. For us. Excellent. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.